Thank you, Ellen, and uh, welcome to the August 2022 meeting for the Pelagic Sailing Club. I met David uh, back in November, December, January timeframe when he was a relatively unknown person just photographing lighthouses in the evening hours and, and running around with a camera and doing all this sort of fun stuff. And uh, then about a month ago, he got featured on a couple of national television shows and he still decided to visit our club and give us an in-person presentation on the wonders of lighthouses at night. So without any further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to David and let him introduce himself and share about uh, how he started doing photographs at night and how it's become a little bit of a, not just sensation, but a, a thing. So <laughs> there you go, David. All right. I, um... I like to move around a bit, so I hope uh, I'm going to be well. I'm going to be tied into this uh, this mic cable, so I can't move the way I normally like to. But uh, thank you, Chris, and and thank you to the um, Dorchester was it Savin Hill Sailing Club. Well, thank you so much for having me. I didn't realize I, I thought I, I thought I was going to be going close to the highway. There's another one over there that we all see as we go by. So I, I was a little bit confused. I didn't know this was even tucked back here. I'm a little guy from Rhode Island, so you know I don't know too much. Um, so, um, so I want to, uh, I have to do a little bit of work here. Uh, hold on. Sorry, folks on the, uh, on the backside there. I'm trying to get the, the folks on the zoom here. I'm trying to get this so that, um, so, uh, thank you for, again for having me. Uh, why am I qualified to stand up here and can you hear me back there? Like, okay. So why, why me and why here? Why right now? Um, so uh, I started a project uh, in 2013 um, when I discovered that uh, lighthouses at night, pictures of lighthouses at night really don't exist. And we'll get around to talking about that uh, in a little bit. Before I go much further, I know this is a sailing club. How many photographers are here? All right, so we have one, two, a couple, three. So I, I won't get very technical then. If I get too technical, just throw things at me because sometimes I have a tendency to do that. I will throw a little bit of jargon out there. Uh, it'll be at, at a minimum. So this is me, obviously. And uh, I have a broadcast camera on my shoulder. Um, I have spent 40 years in broadcast television as a cameraman. Uh, 30 of those years has, have been at the network level. So I've done a lot of work for um, uh, ABC, NBC, CBS. Uh, I've been to four Winter Olympics. I do a, a big, I've done a, a, a big mixture of both news and sports. Um, I spent a lot of time with Tom Brokaw, traveling with him doing documentaries for the Olympics in, in Torino in 2006. Um, and I've worked with all the big names. I was working in local news in Providence in 1990. I'd been there for 10 years and I got recruited to work at the network level. And my first network interview was Diane Sawyer interviewing Catherine Hepburn in her townhouse in New York City. So I was like, ah, yeah, I was, but I, but, but I didn't have a big role. I sat in the corner with one camera and I was, you know, a minor, minor role, but that was my introduction to the networks. So um, in 1993, uh, my wife and I moved our family uh, to uh, North Kingstown. And in North Kingstown was this sad, looking lighthouse underneath the Jamestown Bridge. And I started taking pictures of it uh, just because it, I just felt really sad about that. Um, and then in 2001, it was announced that, that they were going to renovate the lighthouse. So I went to the group, the Friends of Plum Beach Lighthouse, and I told them what I did in television. And I said, um, can I do a documentary on the renovation? And they said, sure. So they, they didn't have that kind of skill set, but they were like, I was like a gift from somewhere and I showed up and I said, I'll do this for you. So I started taking more pictures and I started shooting video when they started renovating it in 2003. So my introduction to lighthouses was through the Plum Beach Lighthouse. And this is the way it looks uh, today. We actually just finished uh, repainting it uh, last week. Uh, since the 2003 initial renovation, we've repainted it uh, three times. And, and the way that we did that was uh, through this license plate. 
I don't know if you've ever seen the Rhode Island Lighthouse license plate, but I created the Rhode Island Lighthouse license plate because I became the president of Plum Beach Lighthouse in 2004. And now we had this beautiful looking lighthouse, but we had to raise money. So we were selling hats and t-shirts and you make no money selling hats and t-shirts. So um, in 2009, I went to the group and said, I think we can do a charity plate. Let's give it a try. And they thought, okay, Dave, whatever. They, you know, they, I've done some crazy things with the group, but um, we got very successful quite fast with this license plate. And to date, we've raised over $300,000 for the Plum Beach Lighthouse. And now our bank account is down to almost nothing because the, the paint job that was just done, in fact, I have to write the last checkout of 42,000. It was $130,000 to repaint the lighthouse. So when you have a, a lighthouse on the water, uh, it, it's, it's very expensive. Um, it's just to get the guys out there and the special paint and there's so many things. So that is how I got involved in lighthouses. So now we have my photographic skills and my lighthouse experience. Um, my wife and I are boaters and we were out on Narragansett Bay and just south of the Plum Beach Lighthouse is a place called Dutch Island. And there's an, another lighthouse out there uh, a very pretty lighthouse that's been renovated as well. And I said to my wife, who's a nurse, by the way, I said, uh, wouldn't it be cool to have pictures of the lighthouse at night? And she said, yeah, whatever. So, cause she's, she's just you know, not into photography. So, um, so I went uh, on October 1st, uh, 2013, I went to the Dutch Island lighthouse and took pictures there for the first time. And I shared those pictures with friends that I'd met who were in the Coast Guard um, that I'd met through Plum Beach Lighthouse. And they were like, oh my God, I've never seen a picture like that before. And I didn't think anything of it at the time. I just was amazed that I could do pictures at night. And the reason I could do it with the camera that I had was that I bought the camera to work at sporting events with CBS Sports. Because this Nikon, had a very uh, special feature within it that I could take still pictures and compile within the camera a time lapse that I could deliver immediately. So when you do a time lapse, you have to take picture after picture after picture after picture over the course of, let's say, 45 minutes. It used to be that I'd have to sit down and compile all those pictures in a computer and then deliver it to the director. When I got this camera, it, I didn't even know it could do this, but it, it could output the, an MOV file. So it compressed these pictures immediately. And so now I can go to the director and say, look, I can do people entering the Super Bowl through the turnstiles and I can have for you immediately deliver to the truck a time-lapse that is done like that. No computer in between, which would take 45 minutes or so. I could be done with it. It would take me 45 minutes to do the shot because all those, you know, shot after shot after shot after shot every 20 seconds or so, but this could compile it immediately and I could hand it to the director. So that's why I bought this camera. It's called Nikon D4. And at the time it was $6,000. But then a couple of years later, when I started taking pictures, I just said, oh, I've got this really nice camera. Let me just try this. So I'd never done, I'd done very little night photography before. As a kid with a film camera, I played around, you know, had cars streaking and, you know, just stuff like this, but I didn't really spend much time outside in the dark. So let's go to the next one now. So that was the first picture ever. So that was taken in October. Three months later in February, I decided to go out again. Now this is Newport. This is Castle Hill in Newport. And, um, and it's in the middle of February, but it's, um, hopefully they can still hear me. I just wanted to sit back because I think I was blocking something. Um, so in February, I went out uh, to shoot Castle Hill. It was a clear night. It was very cold. It was about 15 degrees, but it was also part of the lunar uh, um, calendar when it was beyond first quarter. So what does that mean? See how blue the sky is? And, and there's very few stars. So I started learning more about the parameters of photography, of night photography. So I started learning that for me and this project, it's very selective when I go out. Like right now is when I should be out there shooting. 
And I'm, so it was a great night. I'd be like, oh, I'm, I have this talk instead, which is fine. But we are, we are getting closer to new moon. So in, I'm sorry? Possibly. That, I can't tell you how many times I've run out because I've heard the northern lights will happen and then, you know, you just never see them. And I'll get to that with some pictures later. So, so I started learning the parameters that I can only go out when it's clear, um, sometimes uh, when it's, um, well, always when it's near new moon, or I start reading the lunar charts so I know, okay, well, the moon doesn't rise until midnight. So I have between like, like 9 or 10 o'clock and midnight. This time of year, you can't shoot until an hour and a half after sunset. So sunset now is what, 7.45, let's say. So I can't start shooting until 9.15 when the, um, <laughs> one, I, so, I, so I can't start shooting until, um, here we go, until uh, nautical twilight takes place. So this time of year, it gets pushed back and I plan on going to Ohio possibly next uh, week and they're further west. So I won't be able to start shooting until 10, 15, 10, 30, even now, because uh, they're on the far western end of the, of the time zone. So uh, let's go to the next one. So, so this is uh, the following summer. Um, this is uh, North Atlanta Block Island. And I'm jumping just to show you a few of the pictures of Rhode Island. And I, I, I uh, cater most of my, my talks to the audience. So most of the pictures you're gonna see tonight are Massachusetts, uh, because I figure that's what you folks would be interested in. I'm not gonna show you, you know, Louisiana and New Jersey and so forth. So um, uh, North Atlanta Block Island, uh, and how do I light it? So for me, it's not only important to get the celestial sky, right? The, the sky above, the stars above, but I wanna see the detail in the lighthouse. So early on, I did a thing called light painting where I would just, like that first picture I showed you of Dutch Island, I lit it with a flashlight. I say, how can you do that? Light it with a flashlight. Well, I open my shutter for, for uh, 25 seconds. And then if I take a flashlight, I can just hit it and light it up a little bit. And that's all you need to make a better exposure of the subject. But it took me a little bit of time to figure out that I have a truck full of TV lights in, in, in my truck. And, and I didn't realize this was a project when I first started. So it took me, um, this keeps on dying out on here. So it took me, um, I don't know, probably 10 or 12 shots of different lighthouses to realize this is really something. I can really do this and I can do it better if I use my TV lights. So in this one, I just put a TV light on the downside of that dune underneath, like facing up. And then the foreground I lit with a flashlight. So I just added light with a flashlight. Now the Milky Way is there. And this is the summer when you get what's called the galactic core, which is that right up right by the tower is the you know really bright stuff. In the wintertime, it starts to fade. And in, um, in the beginning of winter, you don't even see the Milky Way. It's there a little bit, but it's not, it's not really pronounced as it's in the summertime. This is a uh, Point Judith in uh, Narragansett, and um, Coast Guard had given me permission to go on the property. And when I get out there, the lights were on in the tower, and they're not supposed to be. They're never supposed to be on in the tower. And so um, I called the chief the next day, and I said, "Eric, the lights are on." He said, "What do you mean the lights are on?" I said, "Yeah, the the lights, like the window the lights are on." He's like, "Oh, those knuckleheads! They left the lights on, which they're not supposed to do." But for me. It was perfect because for photography, it's great because otherwise it's just black, you know, black windows. Um, but this is summertime, you know, you look straight up and there's the Milky Way. And, and you get really dramatic pictures when you have these beautiful Fresnel lenses shooting out really uh, magnified beams of light and it's hitting um, the humidity that's in the air. And it looks like uh, beams of light, but that's actually the shadows of the structure of the, of the roof and of the, the lamp itself. So it looks, people say, oh, you're shooting beams out. Well, the beams of light are the wide ones. It's actually, so those are shadows that are coming out. So next one. And so this is Watch Hill. And this is where I grew up in Southern Rhode Island. So uh, if you happen to see the, the Today Show piece, I talk about hearing the 
Like I heard that every night as a kid, because we were about a mile from the from the lighthouse. And by the way, you know, Watch Hill is a very wealthy community. My dad was a letter, a letter carrier, and we we lived on the road to Watch Hill, so so I wasn't in Watch Hill. But if you ever saw Mystic Pizza, uh, that was Julia Roberts' big, you know, coming out uh, before Pretty Woman, but that was one of her first films. Well, my role in life was the Julia Roberts character. I used to chase the rich girls in the summertime. And, and much of that film was shot in Watch Hill. And in fact, there's a big scene where she dumps fish in the guy's truck, uh, car rather, that was at the Mesquamica Club. I worked at the Mesquamica Club as a kid, cutting greens, and I got invited to um, the governor's ball. And I had to hide the entire night from the manager because I wasn't supposed to fraternize with the guests. And so just like in the movie, where the part that she played, that was my part. And so I so identified with Mystic Pizza. But this is Watch Hill Lighthouse. And this is a combination of lights. I put a light, one of my uh, TV lights uh, behind the shack. It's not a shack, but it's actually the oil room, oil house of the lighthouse. And then um, lit the lighthouse. Am I blocking you guys here? I, uh, I lit the lighthouse uh, tower with that light that's behind the oil house. And then I had my assistant standing about 20 feet away and he just uh, waved the flashlight to light the rocks in the foreground. And of course the Milky Way again was there. I was the artisan in residence at the Ocean House uh, in the summer of 2018. And we had uh, workshops that I was going to run. And I looked at the forecast on, a, and on Monday, it's the forecast for Friday and Saturday, the nights of the, of the workshop was that it was gonna be cloudy and rainy. So we ran out on Tuesday and we got these shots. And then when I had the workshop, which we had to hold anyways in the rain, I held up my phone and said, this is what you can get if you're here on a clear night. But what you don't see in this is, is the kind of research you have to do when you're going out to shoot lighthouses. So if, if the uninformed shows up at the Watch Hill Lighthouse to take pictures at night, it's almost impossible. Because if you see in the corner, I'm just going to put this down. This right here, that's a security light that they have on every night. And if you show up unannounced and you don't know who to call, that's going to blast light out at you and you cannot do photography at night. And there's a lot of lighthouses that are like that. Montauk Point is like that. Horton's Point on, on Long Island as well is like that. These lights come on and you are done unless you've done your homework, you've got permission, you've done all the research, um, you know that you've talked to the keeper, they're going to turn the lights off. Or in the case of Montauk Point, they actually handed me the key in the afternoon. They said, they showed me where the light switches were. They said, here's the key put it in the flower box and lock up when you're done. That's how much um, cooperation and trust people have in me because they know my background and they, they've seen my website and they, don't, they know the work and they know what it is I wanna do. I wanna capture the lighthouse for, his, for history because I haven't mentioned this yet. Historically speaking, um, historical pictures of lighthouses at, working at night don't exist. Try looking for them. You will not find a black and white photograph of a lighthouse working at night, or I challenge you to. I've been looking for eight, nine years now, and I have yet to find one. Now, why is that? Well, first of all, lighthouses were considered like quasi-military. So the government run, they were mostly uh, locked at night. And so there was very little access for the public. And then film couldn't do the kind of work that we're able to do with digital cameras and the software that's associated with them. So not until these great cameras, even the first uh, uh, generations of digital cameras weren't capable of doing the work that we can nowadays. The first digital cameras are, were terrible in low light. They've gotten really, really better, much better. And by 2010, 2012, that's when they got better than film. Greg. So the red light is a buoy. And the other one is probably Jupiter. So in the, as the, 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 the brightest star on the lower left-hand side. Uh, that could be uh, something out on Long Island because that's going towards the south. Um, I don't, it's not Block Island. Block Island is more to the, to the left. Uh, it's probably something out towards uh, uh, Montauk or out that way. 
Okay, Chris, we can go to the next one. So, uh, in by 2015, um, I'd, I'd shot probably 10 or 12 of the Rhode Island lighthouses. The only, there's only 17 of the original 25 lighthouses that are still working in Rhode Island. So when you have a lighthouse that's been turned off, it's called now called a standing lighthouse. There's a bunch of them around here, like Stagecoach Har Harbor in, um, in Hyannis. There's another one, uh, I forget the name of it. There's a couple, of them, a couple more in Hyannis that are no longer working lighthouses. Newburyport's got a couple of them that aren't working anymore. Um, so those are standing lighthouses, and I'm not interested in those for obvious reasons. They're not as dynamic. So I ran out of my material, ran out of material in Rhode Island pretty quickly. And in 2000, um, uh, four, 2016, sorry, I had a, um, a two night job with CNN back when uh, um, Alan Dershowitz was doing a lot of work in CNN and it was the Palestinian uprising, maybe it was 2015. Um, so I got hired for two nights uh, out on Martha's Vineyard but we worked from about eight o'clock till midnight and we weren't working till the next night at eight o'clock. So I brought my still camera with me and um, didn't, didn't bring any lights, but I had a flashlight. And with my, uh, with the live truck operator I was with, he was, became my assistant. So we went out from like midnight to two or three in the morning shooting the lighthouses of Martha's Vineyard. So this is Edgar town. The problem that you run into, which you don't see during the daytime are the influences you run into at night, like those really, really bright lights, uh, sort of towards the center bottom. Um, that was that, that are, those are ships in the harbor that had their lights on. So I mentioned before I do these long exposures. So if I'm doing a 20 second long exposure and there's a really bright light, that's going to burn a lot of light into the into the frame. But uh, then you get the you know the Milky Way. You can't get the Milky Way unless you do a long exposure. But if you do too long of an exposure then the movement of the earth gets picked up. And I'm not into having the lights, the, the stars streak. And you see sometimes people do these pictures where you see all the streaking stars. That's really a gimmick. What I'm trying to do is to capture as much as I can what's realistically in front of me. And ethically, I try to capture that as well. So I follow what's called the uh, Associated Press style book. And so I'm not manipulating pictures. I'm not adding stars. I'm not taking anything away, except I will take away airplane strobes that, that go over because I just can't, I can't be staying there all night. And one of the places that you'd be really surprised on these really, really dark nights in Maine, Maine is a super highway to Europe. So you can be laying there at one, two o'clock in the morning, up oh, there goes the LA flight, you know, the, everything flies over Maine if they're not going further north. But a lot of, a lot of highway, a lot of um, uh, flights go right over Maine and they can totally interrupt the photography. Another one, this is Aquina. This is before they moved it. Um, and this is the night that the skunks had um, uh, all their babies. <laughs> so, so I'm shooting, I hear this rustling. I look down, I go, oh, and I just like, okay. But if you don't move and you don't bother them, they don't bother you. And we were fine. We all got along. Um, really, really hard to shoot this one because it's the, the magnification. They have a really bright light and a great uh, lens. It's, it's not a Fresnel lens as, we, as the traditional Fresnel lenses are, but it is like an aircraft beam and it's really bright and it aims right down at you because it's, it's designed to go right down below the cliffs. So, the, so that if you're standing 20 feet from the lighthouse and you look up, you're gonna get spanked in the face by the light from the lighthouse because it's designed to be able to shoot down below. That's gay head. Yeah, so known as Aquina. Yeah. So, yeah. It, well, okay, so it is red. It alternates red and white. So the problem now with doing a long exposure is that the white will overpower the red. So there are times when you, you have to compromise. And I had no control over that light. A couple months ago, I was at Wood Island up in Maine, and that flashes alternate green and white. But since I was with the foundation, they brought me out there. Um, they said, oh, we, I asked them if I could cover the, the white light. So in my pictures, it's only green because I know that over that, that 20 seconds, the white's gonna blow out any other color. So you learn that through the photography. So when you can have control over the light, then, then the pictures turn out so much better. 
Sorry? So we cover, I, I carry materials called black wrap. It's, um, black wrap is like a, aluminum foil, but it's black. And you can hear, I could take this cup and I could just wrap it around this cup and it, and it would take the form of the cup. Um, and, and it keeps it black and it keeps all the light in. Uh, so it's a theatrical um, uh, tool. And so I carry a roll of it with me uh, because you never know what you're gonna run into. You know, there's, there's lights everywhere that you don't see in daytime pictures, you don't see lights that are gonna be there at night because, well, you can't do the research on all the lighthouses because first of all, as I told you before, there's very few pictures of lighthouses from nighttime. So you have to have all these tools with you in order to control the light. Because if you don't have control over the light, you're not going to walk away with a good picture. Let's go to the next one. So this is East Chop out of Martha's Vineyard. And this is a great story. So I'm standing there. So this is, I'm going to just show you. The lighthouse is in front of me. Can you see that OK? OK. The lighthouse is in front of me. And I think I'm all alone. And I hear giggling behind me. So back there, can't see them, but there's a couple on the, on the fence. And they're making out and whatever. OK, all right. It's, it's 1.32 o'clock in the morning. So I turn back, clicking away, click every 20 seconds or so. I hear voices over here on my left. I can't see them because there's three or four people laying in the grass just looking at the stars. It's a beautiful night. It's just a great thing to be doing. OK, so I come back. Click, click. <laughs> I smell pot. All right, that, whatever. Oh, oh, there's a couple over there. Okay, great. Click, click. So I finish my photography. I get back to the hotel. It's now three o'clock in the morning. I start looking over all the pictures. I'm going over scrutinizing. Oh, the milk oil looks great. The milk, oh, it looks like a street light. Oh, it's not. Wait a minute. There's six pictures I took of this very image six of the sequence of six only one has what i thought was a street light that ladies and gentlemen is not a street light that right there is the lighting of the joint <laughs> i had to leave it in it's a great story because because otherwise you know it's like okay so it's not there so you know it's black you know it's not there if, if i don't shoot so you know the first shot second shot maybe the third shot of all the six shots only one of them has the, and I didn't even, I was probably distracted at the time, you know, looking, oh, who's over there, who's back there. I never saw it being lit. When I go back, if I made that bigger, you'll see there's a couple sitting there and they get their legs crossed on that bench. So I had to leave that in because it's such a great story. And by the way, this is lit only by the lights that are there um, because there's a street light just off frame. Uh, it's, um, as I mentioned before, having control, there are sometimes you cannot have control over the scene. Like if you try to go down and shoot um, Ned's Point in Mattapoisett, there is a floodlight at the very beginning of the park that throws light and over the entire park. And I've been there and I've tried to shoot. I was there recently and I shot on the backside. So I, I blocked that light with the lighthouse. But, but the background of the, of the shot is all bright from this sodium vapor light, which is the worst kind of light when you're doing photography. So sometimes you just can't control it. You have to, you show up, you get the shot. It's a shot of the lighthouse working at night. And sometimes there's just too many, too many lights, too many ambient lights from a city, too many, maybe there's a power plant next door. Maybe there's a, you know, big gas tank next door, who knows? Um, so in this case, uh, I pretty much had to go with what was there. Anyone know what this is? Cape Pogue, it's also on Martha's Vineyard. So I had, uh, I called up the trustees of the reservation, told them what I was doing. They thought it was awesome. So they, they linked me up with the ranger. Uh, he actually met me out there. He gave me a tour of the lighthouse. I, I don't go in the lighthouses very much. Uh, he was going there to take the flag down. He was like, hey, you wanna go up? And it was, the sun was setting. I actually brought a generator in my truck and I, uh, a George Foreman grill. And I made up a, a couple of burgers and you know, had dinner while the sun was setting and I was waiting for it to get dark. You may know that out on the vineyard and on Cape Cod, the only thing holding Cape Cod and the vineyard together, the sand, is the poison ivy. So, 
and and you're not allowed it's my understanding you're not allowed to kill the poison ivy because you're killing this root structure and all of that in the foreground is poison ivy so you have to be real careful if you're as allergic to it as i am uh that you don't go wandering into it but um yeah you gotta be real careful out there this is before i was using tv lights so i i lit this in the foreground uh with a flashlight so i stepped away from the camera so in the camera that I have, I can set it up so it takes a picture. It takes picture after picture. It's called an interval timer. So I can set it up on a timer and it starts shooting. So you hear a click. Now, if I took a shot every second, it will go click, 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 click. But I take a shot every 20 seconds. So every 21 seconds, it's a new click. So I hear click and then I'll wait You know, 20 seconds. There'll be another click. So that's, so what I'll do is I'll walk away from the camera when it's on the tripod when I'm alone and I'll light from away from the tripod. So what I do when I'm out there is I separate the light from the subject from the camera. So I create shadows, which you live in this one, a little bit of shadowing on the right side and, and I create the lighting. Uh, and you'll notice that as we go further in the pictures because I started advancing my uh, lighting setup as I go further into the project, as I, said before when I got smart and started using my TV lights that at this point I hadn't started yet but we'll uh, but soon I will so <laughs> could be could be which by the way that's an interesting point so early on I didn't think about safety equipment but it wasn't until I was alone on a jetty on June, uh, July, I'm sorry, January 22nd, 2015. So the winter of 2015 really didn't start until uh, January 25th when those storms started cycling through here and we had 120 inches of snow in Boston. So on, on January 22nd, I know the date because it's my, one of my kids' birthdays, I went down to, um, uh, it's called Lynn Point and then um, in Old Saybrook and the Old Saybrook Breakwater and I started walking out on the breakwater alone and no one knew I was there. I, was, I told my wife I was going out to shoot lighthouses and it was nice and calm at, uh, there's two lighthouses right near each other, Lynn Point, I shot that one. And then I started going out on the, on the breakwater and I had no safety equipment. I had no PFD, I had no headlamp, I had no um, uh, helmet. Now I always wear safety equipment because I've, I've been stupid at times, and there's been some lighthouses where it's you know been 300 feet in from the water. I'm like, oh, this is this is no problem. And it's on those instances where you feel really comfortable is when you get into trouble. So I was at Sandy Hook, New Jersey, and I'm walking along. Didn't realize there was a curb that they made this bike path, but they put bricks, raised bricks between the road and the bike path. And I'm walking, looking at the lighthouse, and I tripped and fell, and my helmet was in the truck and my gloves and everything else. Everything is in the truck, how stupid. I also, in my PFD, I carry a personal EPIRB. You're all boaters, you know what EPIRBs are. I've got a little cell phone size EPIRB in the pocket. It's got my number that, you know, bounces off the satellite if I fall in the water and they send, they'll send rescue out knowing that some idiot taking pictures in the middle of the night. So uh, I use an abundance of safety equipment just because I want to get back alive. So. Uh, I digress a little bit, uh, and then we know, you must know this lighthouse, Sankety, Sankety on uh, Nantucket. So just like, um, well, with Martha's Vineyard, I had uh, had someone else pay for my trip out there because it was CNN, but uh, going on to, um, to Nantucket, my assistant, um, who was a guy by the name of Sean Daly, he was a reporter in Providence for 20 years, and we did a lot of work together early on but he's really into the project. And his family also has uh, a house out on, on uh, Nantucket. So he went out there with me and we shot uh, all three of the Nantucket lighthouses on the same night, including this one. So this is another case where the lighthouse is really bright, really strong. When you stand away from it and point your camera at it, the light, the beams will spank a camera and it really interrupts the photography. So in some cases like this one, you stand underneath it and shoot up and you can get some really great shots with that whole helicoptering effect. Um, as I said on the Today Show, it's, it's almost godlike. You know, it's really, you know, it really has this appeal to it. 
Next one. Well, here's a, here's a great point. So this was the, I use this as the cover of my first book. And, and when I shot this, uh, Sean was with me uh, the same night. We shot this one before we shot Sanctity. Um, so you can still see the twilight over on the lower right. And um, um, in the center is a, is a red light. That's Brant Point uh, off in the distance. But when I shot this, um, this was only like the fourth or fifth Massachusetts light that I shot. So it's still early in the whole pro uh, project. Um, we set up a, a TV light about 75 feet away. And I, that texture that you see is in the lighthouse. But I was able to pull it out with the way that I was able to light it. I mentioned before, separate the camera from the light from the subject. So now I've created shadow on the left-hand side, this really great texture you see in the middle. And then the sand, I had Sean kneel down and just rake a flashlight back and forth, low to the ground. So you create not only the light, but you create the shadow with all those, well, it's probably where people walked or you know, where the rain hit or whatever. So when I looked at the back of the camera, this is one of the first pictures that I thought, this is a perfect exposure. And I did very little of this in what's called in post, in editing. I mean, I, every picture is edited. Um, afterwards but this one was one of the uh most pure pictures that i've ever taken because i could see it when i was shooting it a lot of times i'm out there shooting and i look at the back of the camera it doesn't look much like it does when i'm done because when i sit in editing there's the images there on the sensor it's what we used to call in photography the latent image is on the film it's there but you pull it out in the dark room by dodging and burning and then the amount of time you keep it in the in the uh in the chemicals and so forth there's a lot of tricks in the dark room we have tricks in editing software but it's very much dark room like but i'm not but i'm not adding stars and i'm so people i could put the milky way in every shot if i wanted to if i knew photoshop if i own photoshop i don't do either i don't own photoshop i don't know photoshop i use what's called lightroom and it's a like a photoshop light but you only have a few of the tools that are in Photoshop. And that's all I need because I'm trying to show people what's there when I'm there. This is all digital. Yeah, you couldn't do this with film. It's just impossible to do it with film. So, so what the, the one variable, any photographers here, the one variable I use in the field is I use the, I make the sensor more sensitive. It's called the ISO. I change ISO in the field based on what's in the sky for light. So if you get into an area like around Boston where there's all kinds of ambient light in the sky, you have to dial down the ISO to try to make the sky as, as dark as possible while you're there, but still capture the stars. So my shots are all predicated on what is in the air when I arrive. And so I preset my cameras uh, knowing, well, I preset them so I don't have to fumble around in the dark and I'll do a test shot. And if I find that it's too light or too dark, then I'll start dialing back on the, on the sensitivity of the camera. That's the only variable that I use in the field other than focus. And I can't do, I'm not doing autofocus because autofocusing is terrible in the dark. I'm doing everything manually. Okay, we'll go to the next one. This is one of my favorite pictures. Anyone know where this might be? Come on, you guys are all Massachusetts people. Come on. It is out on the Cape. This is Race Point out on uh, Provincetown. So Provincetown has got three lighthouses uh, and this is one of them. So what I did was I put a light up on the dune uh, to light the, the lighthouse, uh, to the keeper's house. I put a light behind the house to light the tower. And uh, Sean was, my, my buddy Sean was actually behind the camera, firing the camera for me while I lit the grass with a flashlight. So this was uh, using three lights. And by the way, uh, we went uh, early January in 2016. Um, a lot of people take, can get rides out there, but the National Park Service has it closed off at night. So we had to walk uh, the mile from the, from the parking lot out to the lighthouse. But what I carry with me also is a portable GPS that tracks us. So when you're out there on these paths, 
at the national seashore, you could be walking along and not even see a path. Path is in front of you like this, comes this way. As you're walking along, suddenly that path is behind you. You turn around and there's a fork in the road that wasn't there before. And you kind of go, wait, which way do we come from? So having a GPS that'll track you makes it so you can get back to the parking lot in a decent, at a decent hour. Because we could have been wandering around the National Seashore for most of the night. Um, yeah, yeah, so this is, uh, this is uh, winter stars. The Milky Way is not present. And now we're only taking a small view of the sky. But just millions and millions of stars. It's just absolutely gorgeous. So this is a, a Plymouth bug light. So, the, so it, this took me about two years to accomplish. I was talking to the harbor master for a long time to try to plan it that I needed to be there. I needed to be in place at the mouth of the harbor, the, the channel there, um, at low tide, at slack tide, uh, after the moon set. So we got out there, it was a, just a crescent moon, and we get out there in time. This is the, actually the test shot uh, once we get set up, we're waiting for slack tide. That, I don't know if you've ever been in there, that, so it's Marshfield, um, Duxbury, and Plymouth. And that's a very, um, it's a lot of water in there, and it's a very narrow channel. So the current that comes through there is really strong. And, and on one, in the channel itself, it's 30 feet of water. But on this side of the lighthouse, uh, if you read the chart, it's only... Uh, three to six feet, depending on where you end up. We ended up in about four feet of water. So how do you get this shot? There's no land there. Any idea how I would get this shot? Any idea? Yes. That's the first step, a boat. But in a boat with a 20 second shot, any, any, thought, any ideas? A tripod. Now we were in four feet of water, but this is, this is a, this is the short end of the tripod. This is at 10 feet at its shortest. And the tripod is usable up to 18 feet. So I was, I mentioned before, I'm president of Plum Beach Lighthouse. So Plum Beach Lighthouse is in the middle of the water. There's no other land around it. And I woke up one night after I'd shot most of the other Rhode Island lighthouses. I'm thinking, how can I get Plum Beach Lighthouse? How can I do it? So I, I got up. I went down, looked at the computer, looked up the NOAA charts, found Narragansett Bay, found that there's an area of 14 feet of water, about 100 feet to the west of Plum Beach Lighthouse. So I went to a friend in town who was a welder in North Kingstown. I said, hey, can you build me a 20 foot tripod? <laughs> so, he, so it's easy to design a tripod, right? So, you know, it's three legs. But then he designed it so there's a pipe within a pipe and there's a set screw at the bottom of each one so that, and they're aluminum pipes, but the set screw is uh, uh, stainless steel. So I can just torque it down and it'll drive into the, into the leg without doing much damage. I mean, the, the, the tripod's only designed probably to last, I don't know, how many 50 or 60 uh, different lighthouse shoots. I've done 15 with it. You can also see uh, the string on the ground. So what we do is we go out and, um, and we find the shallow water electronically uh, through the depth gauge I have. And then we, we uh, drop two anchors, one at the bow, one at the stern. And then we do a sounding. So it's lead weight on a string, which is what you see on the ground there. And, um, and when that lead weight hits the bottom, I know whether it's, whether it's sandy, which is really preferred because you get a thump. I see people you know, you see, you know, shaking your head, yeah. So if, even when you, when you fished with a lead weight, right? So you can feel it, you, that, that vibration comes back. If you hit a rock, it goes ding, you know? But if you hit sand, it just goes thump. So I love the thump, you know, <laughs> as opposed to the ting. Yes? Yep. No, we stayed there. I stayed there, but it's just because it was just too. Oh, oh. Yeah. That light, the one we just showed you, that's, you can. No, that's my house. <laughs> yeah. 
that's okay. Um, uh, so let's go to the next one. So this is me using the, the uh, tripod. So there's a bracket at the top that I can put into the tripod. Now I'm bringing the camera into the boat and my hands are never more than an inch or two away from the camera in case something uh, uh, dramatically goes wrong and I have a quick release on it. So I can just grab the camera and quick release and I have it back in the boat. So you can see my hands are never for, you know, a couple inches away. And I just did a shot uh, uh, two weeks ago in Stanford Harbor, uh, Stanford, Connecticut. And that took me a couple years to get to. And primarily because every summer there's ospreys that, that are up on the lighthouse. And when I went out there a couple weeks ago, we, drew, we went around the lighthouse and, um, and the ospreys took flight and they were, they were pretty ticked off that we were that close. So we just put the tripod down. It was only in three feet of water, but I have a clamp. So now we put it, put the tripod out. Top of the tripod is way up here, but I have clamps that I could clamp onto any any one of the legs, and I put my camera on that. So the tripod still works the same as long as you just have the stable uh, platform for it. Uh, so any idea where this might be? Think Cape Ann. Think Anasquam. So most of the pictures you see of Anasquam are are from uh, the neighboring like the, the neighbors next door. But I had uh, gotten permission from the admiral of the first district to go on any Coast Guard property, as long as I gave them a call and let them know. So uh, on this particular night, they allowed me to park uh, uh, in the driveway. And I just walked through the gate. And uh, I was lucky because it was low tide. This is a completely different picture. If, uh, if I waited, you know, five, four or five hours, that all fills in. But I got lucky, the lobster trap was there. And I, I'm now using on the Massachusetts lights, my, um, my TV light is hidden behind the, the, the nice shingles there, hidden behind the house there, just hitting the lower part of the tower and the back side of the tower. And then I hit the front of it with my flashlight. And the lights that are on inside are just the reflection inside the lighthouse tower of the, of the beam when it goes off. So there's no actual lights on in the tower itself. It's just the, it's a 20, I'm doing a 20 second long exposure so that a little bit of light goes a long way. So this is the only, uh, well, there's two, we have two pictures up in my house. The Sankity one I showed you before, which is above our fireplace and this one my wife likes, so it's in our bedroom. Um, next one. So this, these are the twin towers of um, Thatcher. Um, I use a 14 millimeter lens. So there's a little bit of distortion there and I try to correct for distortion uh, in Lightroom. What happens with, the, what happens with the, the lens is that if you're really close to something, it, your, your um, vertical lines kind of come in. So when you correct it in the distortion correction uh, filter of the software, it, it, it straightens it out, but you lose a lot of the picture. This um, was very little room to move we're backed up as far as we could go uh, without falling off a seawall. Um, and so uh, what I had done about a month before this, I was with, no, I'm sorry, late November of 2016, uh, my friend Sean and I took my whaler out of Rockport Harbor. They said the, the winds were gonna be from the west, which you think, okay, we're in the lee if it's from the west, and there was gonna be five to 10. We got outside the harbor, it was 20 to 25 out of the north. So, so, so we got between Straitsmith and Thatcher. And since the wind was out of the north, we were in the lee at that point. It was nice and calm. As we got closer to Thatcher, the waves started picking up. It was, so it's a mile away. So it's just enough that that you know, 20 to 25 started blowing. We tied up to the mooring that's out there. And now we've, we're facing to the wind. And I carry my inflatable on the on the bow of the 15 foot whaler. It's only a seven foot inflatable. I'm trying to release the inflate the inflatable, and waves are coming not only over the bow, in between the inflatable and the bow, but it's also coming over the bow of the inflatable. So so I look back at Sean. I'm like, I don't think we're going to do this. And when we were there, like the lighthouses were right there. Like we we could reach out and almost touch them. But he was like, Hey, you know. Dave, I, I'm with you. Let's 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 bail. Let's get out of here. And we had to. So we only went like two or three hundred feet, and we were now back in the lee of Straitsmith, and it was nice and calm. But it was like, 
we're counting our blessings that we got out of there. It was, it was really a, a tough go that night. I returned a month later uh, with my daughter, who was at the time was about uh, early 30s, and, um, and she helped me out. Now, when you go out there at early June, um, there's seagulls all over the place, and they are, they are um, it's rookery, so they're, they're nesting, and they're very angry. So, uh, and they were all over the place. And I don't, in this shot, you can't see them, but I've, I've shot, I shot the other two towers and in those shots, you can see they're all, you can actually see a couple beneath the, the railing of the deck right there. But there were hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of seagulls out there. So here's Straitsmith. So this is um, uh, that later on we shot so I, we shot the thatcher first and then sean and i went back a couple weeks later so i've now lit the, the house with one light lit the lighthouse with a second light and the foreground rocks were lit with a flashlight and then off in the distance you see thatcher so there's actually three lighthouses in this shot with the you know great this is probably late june so it's probably late at night because the sun sets at 8.30. So we're not out there, you know, shooting until 10, 10.30. And, um, but the Straitsmith is loaded with poison ivy as well. So you have to be careful and, and ticks. So yeah. you, know, you have to worry about that too. Okay. So it's uh, the Aurora Borealis, as uh, Craig mentioned earlier. Tonight they're saying you, there's the possibility of seeing the Aurora far south. In the winter of 2015, when we had all those storms, there was a report that the aurora might be able to be seen on Cape Cod. I thought I could get to Maine, but the, the, a storm had just pulled out and Maine was still getting the storm. So I actually followed snow plows out on Cape Cod from Rhode Island to the Cape. Uh, and as we get further out on the Cape, there was less and less snow. So you pull up to Highland Light and Truro and there's no snow in the parking lot because there was a 40 to 50 mile an hour wind as I pulled up. I couldn't, I, you know, one of those deals where you're like trying to push the door open. So I got it open. I was like, whoa, I was getting blown around. So I, in my truck, I have sandbags to put on equipment. Um, so I put the tripod up and put sandbags on it. And I, and I sort of hid behind the truck in the lee of the truck, if you will, to get this shot. Because when I got out, I could see something on the horizon. I couldn't quite make it out but the camera sees a lot more than our eyes can see, especially at 20 seconds. Like we see an instant, right? So this sees a much longer exposure than our eyes do. And so when I was done with this exposure, I looked at the back and I, there was something there. And so I had, I didn't realize I only had 20 minutes, but I shot a couple different angles of the lighthouse. And then after 20 minutes, it just, whoosh, it just disappeared. And like 10 minutes later, a guy comes driving up in his car and he jumps out and he goes, did you see it? Did you see anything? I said, yeah, but you're a little too late, though. So it's one of those things where the aurora, you either get it or you don't. And, and I've, I have had so many, I can't tell you the, the maybe 15 to 20 times where I've gone out at two in the morning because there's been reports that the aurora is going to be seen and have never seen it. But this is, this is the only time I've ever seen the aurora. And it's as far south as it's probably been seen in these in around here in a long time. So you get really lucky when you can get the aurora. Any idea where this might be? This, I got very angry on this shoot because Sally Snowman, who, who, um, who ran the Boston Light for a long time uh, and ran it like it was hers. And so I had, I had worked through the Admiral through the uh, uh, PIO, which is public information officer of the Coast Guard, had total permission to be out there, had permission to bring my boat out there, had permission to dock. And we pulled up and Sally Snowman said, you're not docking here. I said, well, we have clearance all the way to the top. She said, nope, that doesn't matter. This, this is, I'm running this lighthouse. I'm in charge here. I said, well, the Admiral said, I, I don't care what the Admiral said. All right, so that's, that's Sally. She, Sally ran things the way she wanted. So I had permission to be there till 10 o'clock. It happened to be uh, like June 24th in 2016, which as you may know, is the second longest night of the year. The night before, the 23rd was the longest night of the year. So the sun didn't set 
and it didn't get dark until about 10 minutes of 10. So I essentially had 10 minutes to shoot, but we had to be off the island by 10 o'clock. So I really only had five minutes to shoot. So I had set lights up and I said, can we stay a little bit longer? No, you can't stay. Sorry, you can't stay. So we, we were very limited. And, um, and I, you know, I, I know, I know in my heart of hearts, I could do a much better job if I could stay the other night, but she wouldn't let us stay. So sometimes you run into that. Um, like National Park Service, National Parks, all the rangers have autonomy over the parks. So you can, I was down in North Carolina recently and the guys down there are great. They let, they say, hey, you, as long as you want, come on down, say. Um, Bass uh, Harbor up in Maine, uh, the woman that runs that, she's tough. She's almost like a Sally Snowman. So I haven't shot up there yet. And then there's others that you get different varying degrees of, of how they're running it. But I'm trying to make nice with people. So um, I'll, I'll get up to Bass Harbor pretty soon. Any wow. idea? It's pretty close to here. Not here. 10 pound island in the middle of Gloucester Harbor. So I had just, um, this is in the fall of 2015. I had a pretty devastating back injury in the late summer of 2015 and I was hobbling around and, uh, and I actually uh, was well enough at this point, it might've been October, November, that I uh, hauled my uh, whaler up to, up to Gloucester. I looked at their charts, saw that you can, there's a ramp behind the high school you can put in, it's only, it's like half a mile out to the lighthouse. Um, but I was researching satellite pictures and, uh, and I was looking for this big rock. I couldn't, and I was going around, I couldn't find it, but, but you don't realize, or you forget, or you don't realize early on that you need to do more research or you need to realize, oh, okay, at low tide, you know, the rock is way up there. So I was looking at satellite pictures from high tide and it looked like the water is right up against the rock. Well, it was at high tide but it's like a 10 foot tide or something, eight foot tide. So a low tide, when I showed up, it was a long walk to get up to that, that rock. And then I landed on the north side of the island and the lighthouse is on the south side of the island. And man, there's a lot of burrs, you know? So I went through the thicket and I was just covered. Uh, they were everywhere. Uh, my PFD had, you know, like burrs on top of burrs on top of burrs. Like when I got, got home, I was like, like using a, comb, a brush to, to get the burrs off. Um, and this is lit. I put a TV light up on a stand, um, light in the backside of the lighthouse, and then I lit the foreground with a, with a flashlight. But I don't think, I mean, I haven't seen any other pictures like this before. I mean, even this is now five or six years ago that I shot this, and I'm still like the only person that, that's going out there to do this. It's just people, it's just not on people's radar to do this kind of work other than mine. So I, I have carry a flashlight. Do I have a what? A, a what kind of light? I'm, I still haven't. Liners, No. Oh, minus light, minus light, minus ledge. Yes, we're gonna get to that. We'll get to that. Sorry. I'm, I'm like a lot of people here. I have hearing aids, so let's go. Um, uh, so this is uh, uh, Winters, Winters Island, I think it was called, in Salem. Yeah, Fort Pickering, um, Winters Island, I think it's called. That. Um, we'll go on the next one. I'll go through some of these fairly quickly too. How's my time, by the way? I always lose track of time. Running out of time? Okay. So Hospital Point, this is uh, a very, important lighthouse to me in the whole history of the project because I got the permission on this night from the Admiral to shoot on all the lighthouses in, in uh, the first district, which is all of New England, all the way down to New York. Um, Cause the Admiral lives in this house and uh, she let me on the property. I was told by the, by the um, lesser officers, oh, you'll never get permission. They'll never let you on. So I, you know, worked through the public information officer and said, look, this is what I'm doing. I think it's a pretty big project. And, and she loved it. So at the time it was Linda Fagan. I mean, it still is Linda Fagan, but at the time she was the Admiral. Well, guess what Linda Fagan's job is now? Anyone know? She's the Commandant of the Coast Guard. So in June, she was promoted, Biden promoted her to be number one, the first female head of the Coast Guard 
the entire Coast Guard is Linda Fagan. And I'm going to reach out to her, see if I can, you know, continue this on the national basis. Look, you were very nice to me back then. And so, uh, but you can see uh, it's the Big Dipper up there. Um, and I, you'll see that in some shots. Uh, so sometimes the Big Dipper will show up. It's on the opposite direction from where the Milky Way is. Huh. Anyone know why this picture's in here? Come on, you guys are boaters. You don't know this? Look on the chart. I, I challenge you to look on the chart when we leave here or tomorrow. Look on the Salem chart. That's the, the range light. So the range light in conjunction with hospital point, which is the front range light, hospital point just aims out of to Salem Harbor. This is the rear range light, the Salem, I mean, the, um, the Beverly First Baptist Church up there in the tower is a little window and they shoot a beam out of that that works in conjunction with Hospital Point. So when you're coming into the harbor, you line up the light in the foreground, which is the lighthouse and the light in the background. So a lot of people don't know that. So this is uh, the one. There were, were once two range lights in the country that were in churches. The other one was in South Carolina. It's no longer operational. So this is the only remaining operational range light that's in a church steeple uh, in the country. So this one only didn't come up really full size, but that's okay. Any idea what this might be? This one is Long Island. So it's right out there. It's very close by. If you go up to Long Island, you can't see it. You can't see it. You can't see it. It's, real, it's all overgrown. And I, it took me four years to get the permission to get out there to shoot this. And then COVID hit. So why did it take four years? Well, they took the bridge down. So it used to be the homeless were, were out there, right? So the bridge was, you know, questionable whether or not it was actually unsafe, but they tore it down. Um, Quincy was happy. They don't want, they don't want another bridge because now, you know, they don't have the homeless to deal with. Um, but I started working through the governor's office, the mayor's office, trying to figure out who has control over the light or the, the property that the light is on. The Coast Guard still maintains the light, but the city of Boston owns the lighthouse and no one could give me an answer for years. I finally got this lawyer who worked with me and he was able to, through the Boston uh, Public Health Department, because it's a whole, you know, with all the mental health people and, and the, you know, the whole clinics that are out there, the uh, Boston uh, Public Health Department ran and still runs the island. And so I called up the Coast Guard and said, look, I, I need to get out there. Can you, can you spare some guys to bring, bring us out? And the, the, the chief, the new chief of the it's called Aids the Navigation Office in Boston on Atlantic Avenue. Um, he loved the project. He's, he knew about it. So he said, yeah, I think we can get you out there. So all their guys are required to have, to have at least 10 hours on the water each year, even if they're not involved with being on the water. So uh, he said, I'll send some guys out there. They'll bring you out. So it was right during COVID. It was, it was uh, June of 2020. So we had to be fully masked and everything. So we went out and, uh, and you can't see... This would be a beautiful shot. If those trees were down, you could see Boston off in the distance, but the, everything's overgrown out there. And when you leave the harbor, you can, you can see the lighthouse, but just barely. It's, the trees have all grown up and the grass was higher than this table. It was really not in very good shape. Any idea? Baker's Island, Salem. So this, I lit one light on the, on the cottage, another light on the tower, and I lit the tree and the, um, and the uh, stone wall with a flashlight. This is a Plum Island Newbury port. So I told, I've told you about having control. I had almost no control here because there's big uh, parking lot lights that throw light everywhere. There's houses right next door. That light that's on the grass that's coming from a street light that's you know, a couple blocks over. Um, so you just sometimes have to shoot what's in front of you and not worry about the light. Okay. This is uh, Eastern Point. 
um, which there's all these signs when you go out there, it says no, no lighthouse access, it's just a bunch of baloney. It's the, it's the neighbors putting it up. And there's a parking lot right there that the Coast Guard has. You can drive right through there and, and go out and, and um, you know, park there and, and go on the, on the breakwater. I had permission to be on the property. Um, but, uh, and this is early on in the project. This is probably one of the first Massachusetts lights where I actually used uh, my TV light. I put it up, uh, it up on, the, on the lawn and then I walked out onto the jetty and then lit the rocks with my flashlight. So I've, um, that's, I have, I've shot all the Massachusetts lights. I didn't include them all tonight uh, because of time, um, but I just wanna show you a couple, a few of the others that are beyond Massachusetts, what I've done. Uh, this is uh, Ram Island out um, in Booth Bay Harbor. And I shot last summer. I reached out uh, to the owner, his name's uh, George McAvoy. He runs the, I don't know if you've been to Booth Bay Harbor, but he runs a railroad museum and he's a philanthropist and, um, it gives a lot of money to Booth Bay. Um, but I reached out to him. I told him what I was doing. He's like, yeah, great. He goes, uh, we'll bring you out, drop you off. And I spent the night. And I like to say with this, on this uh, night, or I say on this shoot, I woke up alone on an island in Maine. And all three are true. So I was out there alone. I stayed in the house. But I lit the house with a light, like way over here. And I hit the, lit the tower with a light behind the house. And I had shot this earlier in the evening when the Milky Way was too far to the left. And so um, I did a whole bunch of pictures and I went into the, to the cottage. I edited my pictures and, and I went back out about 1.30 in the morning. And it sounds real easy, but the walk to get from the house to where I finally ended up, it's really pretty tough because you're there at night and there's all these rocks, there's loose gravel, you know, you're right by the water. It's, it's anything but easy but I had all my safety gear on, I was alone. So I had to be real careful. Um, but it's really, you know, I, I waited till the Milky Way got to the, the better position, compositionally speaking. Uh, about two weeks earlier, um, and it was right after uh, full moon, it was early in the lunar, uh, lunar uh, cycle, but I knew I had a couple hours before the moon was to rise couple hours of really dark skies. This is um, Burnt Island Station, also in Booth Bay Harbor. Beautiful, beautiful property. It's on an island all by itself. They, uh, the caretaker took me out there. Uh, they built this big uh, barn uh, where they uh, bring school kids out and it, it's a dormitory. I was the only person in the dormitory that night. Just really beautiful. But I had to don my waders and my ice crampons because all the rocks are not only uh, dark and slippery. A lot of them are, are slippery, but they're also covered with, you know, two feet of, of seaweed that when the water rises, they, the seaweed just sort of goes like this. When the water goes away, it just all lays flat on the rocks. So I ventured out down by the water and whenever I can get a reflection shot of a lighthouse off the water, it's, it's a bonus. It really adds to the shot. And this is... Hatteras Lighthouse down in North Carolina. And a couple, a couple years ago, um, I was talking to the educator of the United States Lighthouse Society. So my project was adopted by the society in 2018 after I gave a presentation at their uh, convention down in um, New Orleans and they loved it. So they adopted the project. So, so now Stars and Lights, I started at Stars and Lights. It's now USA Stars and Lights but it's under the 501c3 of the United States Lighthouse Society. It's a nonprofit. So I'm, everything that I shoot is, gets donated now to the Lighthouse Society because it's part of this collection that has never existed. So I'm talking to Eleanor Dwyer. She's the educator of the society. And I was writing at the time a National Endowment for the Arts grant, which I'm a pretty good photographer, but I'm a terrible grant writer. I'm 0 for 4 in grant writing, but I said, I'm writing a grant so I can get an RV, so I can travel the country and do this safely during COVID. She said, Dave, why are you doing that? John and I have got an RV we haven't used in two years. It's sitting in our driveway. You can take it. We'll give it to you. I said, no, no, give it to me. Give it to the society. So it's got Washington state plates. It's registered and licensed in Washington, but I have it in Rhode Island and I use it on the road. And it's, it came with the name Ruthie. 
So I said, okay, Eleanor, what's the significance of Ruthie? She said, oh, it's my late mother's name. I said, oh, really? Guess what my, my mother's name was? My daughter's middle name is Ruth as well. So Ruthie is now, what I do now is when I can take Ruthie on, on shoots and, and she gets really mad at me when I can't take her to islands and so forth. But, but um, when I get to places like North Carolina, like um, Hatteras, uh, I get beautiful shots of the lighthouse and then I'll get shots of Ruthie on location with the hope of someday doing a children's book called Ruthie's Big Lighthouse Adventure. So you'll have, you'll have astronomy, you'll have uh, lighthouse history, you'll have geography, you know, all, and, and, and beautiful pictures with a story that we're gonna meld together. And so that it could also be a coloring book too with my pictures, you know, so that people, so the kids can color around it and so forth. So the red lights, so, so when they moved in 1999, I think, they moved the Hatter's light because uh, it was about to fall into the ocean. So they moved it 750 feet, but it became controversial because there was a cell tower that was set back. And in the orig original Hatteras lights, you, you couldn't see it because it was always behind everything. But now that you can go around the lighthouse, you, the, the cell tower is, it shows up in shots. So it's kind of a, a lot of people were kind of uh, upset about that, but you know, that's the way, that's the way it goes. I think that might be it. Oh no, so I have a few more. So body light, also in North Carolina. I went down there in February. I shot seven lighthouses in three nights. Um, when the gas was, um, well, the cheapest I had was 290 and then it was 321 out on Hatteras, early February. And then Ukraine happened and I haven't been on the road in Ruthie since, um, but I may go to Ohio next week because the gas prices are back down again. Cause that's, that becomes really, you know, it's really heavy on the on the pocketbook. Uh, a couple more, and then then I'm then I'm done. Uh, this uh, I shot uh, about six weeks ago. Uh, this is off of Staten Island, New York. Uh, it's a range light that works with the Staten Island uh, lighthouse, which is in the middle of Staten Island, up on a hill. This is called West Bank. It's in the Ambrose Channel, leading into New York Harbor. And this um, those rocks in the foreground. At one time, there it was a nice jetty like the one we just saw at Eastern Point, but Superstorm Sandy went blowing through here, knocked over the neighboring Old Orchard Shoal Lighthouse, which was very close to this one off Staten Island, knocked it over and it rearranged the rocks. So when I got out there, uh, a buddy of mine, uh, we took uh, his boat from uh, uh, the Hudson River uh, down, by, down past Manhattan. And then we got out here um, and I rowed ashore with my inflatable and I climbed up on a ladder. You can just, you can't really see it in the shot. But now I'm up on this jetty, which there's no rhyme or reason to it. I mean, the rocks are all this way and that way. And they're completely covered with guano. So the, we scared the comorants away when we pulled out there. Not only is that guano, it's fresh guano. <laughs> so it was gross. I mean, I, and I didn't have gloves, but I had, I had a change of clothes back on his boat. But I'm like, you know, trying to, you can't just go from rock to rock to rock. You have to go slide down one rock and then get up on the next one. And it was really, really difficult. Uh, and then um, my buddy and, and, and his two friends that were on his boat, they lit the lighthouse from, from his boat uh, that's lighting the tower. So as I said earlier, I'm trying to get the detail in the lighthouse as well, but not only have detail, but have shadowing. So the photography comes into play here. When we anchored the boat, I knew exactly where I wanted to be and that I wanted to be on as far as I can get out on the jetty. And so here's, I mentioned this before, Stanford Harbor. So this is the, this is the lighthouse. Um, it's only three feet of water. My brother was visiting from Texas. He was off on the side, just, you can't see him. He's just off the side to the right uh, with us, with the light uh, hitting it a little bit. And that cloud that's behind there wasn't there when we started, when we get set up waiting for it to get dark, but we could see this fog bank coming in. So we had to work fast. And, uh, and as soon as it got dark enough, I kind of forced it to shoot earlier because we had to get back because we didn't have radar. We just had, we had GPS, um, even though there weren't a lot of boats out there, but we had, um, we had about a 10 minute ride back uh, to another cove, um, but I didn't want to have to do it in the fog. Um, and I think there's one more. 
so this was just um, about three weeks ago, um, the same week as the as the Stanford one. This is called Cuckolds, which is also in the middle of Booth Bay Harbor. This lighthouse uh, was owned is owned by the town. Was taken over by uh, a guy who's really rich. Um, he 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 knew how to infuse vodka with with fruit, and he sold it uh, his patent to uh, uh, Absolute uh, for nine hundred million dollars. So so then he started throwing his money around uh, Booth Bay Harbor, and when the town had the had the lighthouse, they didn't know how to raise money for it. And he said, "Look, I'll I'll raise money. I'll build." The new, I'll uh, rebuild the building out there and we'll have it as a bed and breakfast. And the town said, oh, that sounds great. So they let him do it. And then when he finished it, he excluded everyone from the town. You can only go out there if you spent uh, 12 to $1,500 a night to stay there. So he's trying to recoup his investment. Well, somebody in town, an astute uh, town's uh, resident, started looking at the deed. And the deed said that it had to be open for the public. So the guy just walked away. He put like $15 million into it and walked away. And the town right now is trying to reclaim it. Uh, there's a whole process to, to own lighthouses. It's part of the National Historic Preservation, Na Lighthouse, National Lighthouse Historic Preservation Act of 2000. And it spells out how you can get lighthouses, how you have to take care of them. They're not gonna just hand you a lighthouse, but if you don't take care of it, the federal government will take it back. Uh, so they have qualifications that you have to have, and it's also, you know, maintaining them. And people think it's easy, but it's very expensive because the, the, the marine environment is really rough on lighthouses. And so the town is trying to get this back. And so I was out there. Um, the Milky Way is really at its, at its peak right now. And, um, yeah, and that's it. And that's what I do. So I think that's it. I don't think there's any more. Thank you. Now. One last thing, um, and, I, and I, I'm very, very appreciative of the Today Show and of uh, PBS NewsHour for both airing stories about my project in the same week. From around Christmas time, I sell a fair amount of books, maybe 100 or so. From January 1st to about um, July 14th, I might have sold 30 books. Mother's Day, you just sell a few. The story hits the Today Show at 8.13. It's a five minute story. 8.17, the first order comes in. The story's not even off the air yet. The first order comes in. By midnight on the 15th, I'd sold 1,700 books. Yeah, right? And then the following week before the PBS story aired, I had to stop selling because we ran out of books. So when Chris called me, he said, Dave, you can sell your books. I said, that sounds great. I don't have any books. <laughs> so so I, I do have books that I, on the way here, the warehouse where we ship them out of, said, Dave, you've got to clear out the books we couldn't send. So if you're interested in seeing or even purchasing what we are known as seconds, I have some seconds with me and I can offer them at, at $20 if you're interested. But I'm not here to sell books. Um, it helps to sell them, but you know they, they've got the books have got dents. They've got you know they've been mishandled by the shippers. You know, so if you're interested, I have those only be, by accident because the the warehouse wanted me to pick them up, and I was passing through Plainville on the way here. So those are available if you're interested. So that's my uh, my sales pitch wasn't very good, but I'm honest with people. I'm not going to sell you books in, you know, at full face value and say you know, tough, you know, because that's not me. In fact, in selling 2,400 books in a week, uh, the biggest problem that we had was the post office, leaving books out in the rain, like packages in the rain, or like, you know, big boxes landing on the books and people show up. My book is destroyed. It's got a huge dent in it. I have a pile at home of returns. There's probably 15 or 20 books that I had to send out new books in my own packaging to make sure they arrived on, you know, safely, because that's customer service, that's what you do. And my name's on the book, right? So when they sent out 2,400, they do it, you know, as cheaply as and efficiently as possible, putting it into a cheap cardboard envelope, 
but they got beaten up. Not all books did, but some letter carriers, they don't really care. You know, it's just you know, jamming it in. So um, thank you so much to the Yacht Club. Thank you to the folks at, at, at home on Zoom, if they're still there. Um, this is a, a labor of love at this point for me. Selling all those books is going to be really helpful because I can start paying for gas again. Because I haven't added up what I've, what I've put into this. But over the course of now nine years, um, it's a lot and a lot of miles. I've been to 19 states and 194 lighthouses and maybe Ohio next week if the weather holds up. I thought it was going to be Ohio last week, but the weather fell apart. I mean, it got cloudy. They said it was going to be clear for three, day, three nights. One night, I can't go out there for just one night. It's gotta be a couple of nights. But uh, thank you so much for having me. And uh, I hope I entertain you a little bit. We'd like to thank you too.